Hello, friends, and welcome to See Joy Yoga. I am Crystal Joy Johnson, um, and I'm going to be leading you through a little lecture here. And I really hope this stuff is as intriguing to you as it is to me, right? I'm going to have a little ditty that goes along with this, as well as a, um, a class. But rather than putting it all in so you have to listen to the lecture or fast forward through, I'm going to separate the lecture out. But I think this is almost just as important as the actions and taking the physical movement classes with it, right? Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about your pelvic floor and your diaphragm and the connection between the two and, and the importance of them um, um, being strong in the body and how in most of us they actually aren't. They're really quite weak, right? So I'm going to try to make it simple, even though it's extremely, extremely complex. We're going to start with the diaphragm. The diaphragm is actually almost where this fan is on my body, so I'm going to leave that down so you can actually see that. Right about here in my body, there is, I'm going to call it a hammock. And it's a diaphragm, but I'm going to think about it as a hammock that runs all the way across my body from right to left and from front to back, right, and all sides in between. This is part tendon, part muscle, and it is the main apparatus of your breathing, right? The technical way it works, and it's way more technical than this, so my people who actually know the diaphragm, please know, I know there's a tendon in the middle of the muscles, but that's too much, yeah? So I think about it as a hammock, and when you inhale, that hammock moves down. And when you exhale, that hammock, the diaphragm, moves up. Next level. When you inhale and that diaphragm moves down, right, it's a contraction of the muscles, the diaphragm moves down, it brings air into the lungs. So the lungs, they don't do the breathing, they're just a container of the, of the breath, right? And when you exhale, that diaphragm releases, relaxes, it moves back up into the lungs and it expels the air out of the lungs. Now, I don't have to go and push my belly in and out and try to get my diaphragm to work. I'm exaggerating, but honestly, I see it quite a lot, or that's the way some folks think about it. The diaphragm is doing is job, but we often interfere with that job. We interfere with it by having tension in this area. One of the main ways we interfere with it, there are other ways. So um, when we are really tense, if we have cortisol, stress releases cortisol. Cortisol prepares the body for fight or flight. And one of the first things that happens when cortisol is released in the body, one, I don't know if it's the first thing, but it's, it's pretty quickly, and it's one of the things that happens when cortisol, cortisol goes in the body, is it prepares our body to either fight, right, or to fly. So what do you think happens to this area if you're getting ready to fly, right, or to fight? Right? Compression comes into these muscles through the core and through the legs, the hips, to get us ready to get out of there. And it might not be something that you always sense every time it's a koosh, but it happens and it does happen and there is contraction. So we're holding this contraction in this area. I'm going to point out another thing that makes that area be really tense so that the diaphragm can't really do its job. And that is suddenly someone cute walks in the door or whoever it might be and we're doing this Right? Anyone? Anyone else? I don't do it anymore. I did it. I, I did it plenty, right? But I haven't done it for years knowing that this is just so terrible for your body for so, so, so many reasons, right? Or if you're someone who wears spanks, now I do have a little bit of elastic in this, right? But it's not so much that it compresses into my body. So if you wear things that cause compression in the area, if you're constantly toning, sucking the abdomen in so that you can look really, really thin, if you only work your six-pack abs and do tons of crunches so that this area moves in, there is nothing but compression. It compresses organs. And more importantly to me, I think, almost in the compression of the organs, you can tell I'm passionate, right, is that 
The diaphragm has nowhere to go. It cannot move down into the abdominal cavity. Your diaphragm gets really weak. And there is a succession of things that happen from you having a weak diaphragm, right? You're not getting enough oxygen in the system. So the body doesn't get the oxygen it needs to stretch, to do all the things the blood, the, all the things the oxygen does in the body. You are not, uh, when the diaphragm doesn't move down, our neck and our shoulders, which have some of the breathing muscles, they're supposed to be compensatory. And when this thing's not working down here, they became some of the main muscles that are trying to move the lungs out to expand to get. So if you never breathe in your abdomen, you're only in your chest, these muscles just get so, uh, I'm gonna say exploited, that's strong language, but seriously, it's exploitation of these core muscles. And then these muscles cause all kinds of issues in our neck and they start to take away the curve. We start to get traps that go up to our ears, right? Uh, so, so you can tell that it's, uh, the, the pelvic floor starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker because they're not in their unison and working together anymore. So big issues, pretty big issues if our diaphragm is weak that they can cause in the body. Pelvic floor. We're going to talk about the pelvic floor a little bit now. The pelvic floor is the hammock at the very base of the body, right? You can think of it running from the pubic bone to the tailbone, and from the inside of the pubis on the sides of the pelvis from right to left. So again, this is a hammock that runs across the entirety at the bottom, the base of our torso, and it holds all of our organs up and inside our body. Pretty important, eh? Yeah, so it can get weak for a variety of reasons. It can get weak because you are constantly going to the bathroom and not, uh, not utilizing the pelvic floor or working it. Like every time you think you have to pee or you walk in the door, you just go to the bathroom and you just pee. Uh, you try to let out anything that you can, anywhere that you can, instead of holding it in and actually allowing that diaphragm, uh, that diaphragm, sorry, the pelvic floor to, to turn on. Because when you go to do your core work, you think you're turning on your pelvic floor, but actually you're gripping your anus and you're grabbing on with your psoas and your butt's doing the work, so your pelvic floor actually never really turns on or very little because all of those other muscles are doing the work of the pelvic floor. Um, people who teach Kegels, unless they're really, really teaching it well and you have a good comprehension of your pelvic floor, usually you're just tightening all of the muscles around it and they're getting stronger and stronger and the pelvic floor might be getting a little stronger, but you know, if it's not isolated, uh, uh, chances are the other muscles, again, overcompensate and then, you know, that causes a whole other slew of issues. So, when you inhale, right, there's a released state in the pelvic floor. It gently moves down. We don't want it to go wide. Oh, and if you have babies, by the way, that's another thing for the pelvic floor, too. And all these women who do tons of Kegels, and then they go in to have their baby, and they think, oh, I should be good, I should be good, I've done 20 million Kegels, are having a really hard time, and it's so strong that it's not malleable, and it rips apart and causes a lot of issues. Um, so, you know, be cautious about this work. Um, pelvic floor and diaphragm, both move down on the inhale gently. Gently, softly. Mm -hmm. When you exhale, pelvic floor and the diaphragm, they both lift up gently, right? It's not that we're cushing, 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 cushing these hammocks. It's the natural action that occurs, yeah? So when you go to do the work in the little ditty, and I'm saying it in, the, in these classes as well, right? But really, honestly, less is more and less is more and less is more. If you feel your anus ripping, do less. If you feel your psoas ripping, do less. If you feel your neck gripping, do less. If you've been doing particular patterns for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life, do you think you're going to release them? A, quickly, B, by doing really strong actions to try to do the opposite thing. Nope, you're not. And maybe, and you can 
have that belief in you if you want and, and work that way. But I, I don't believe that is the way to change the relationship. And one more thing, and then, and then we'll be done with the lecture portion. And that is that every other person, I mean, honestly, it's probably like 75% of the people that I talk to in doing body work, and I've been doing it now for over 10 years, and before that I was still doing, technically, teaching gymnastics and uh, uh, various other things that I've taught, strength and stretch and, and things along the way. So I've been working with physical bodies, including my own, for a very long time. I'm not saying that makes me an expert, but 75 to 80% of the people, when I work with them, want a stronger core. I want a stronger core. Um, and I have a big beef with that. I don't think that people need stronger cores. I think they need to change the relationship of their core so that the muscles that have been overworking so as anus, uh, buttocks, uh, 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 the six pack ab, right? So that the people, right, so dominant. So that the people who have overworked those muscles and used those muscles almost entirely and have not used the smaller stabilizers, the smaller muscles that help, right, recruiting everything, not necessarily everything, but you know what I mean, recruiting all of the muscles, including the little bitties necessary so that everything doesn't have to overwork. Those other pieces, those gross muscles don't overwork. So I think when you talk about strengthening your core, I don't think it's that you're strengthening your core. I think there are some muscles that you are learning to let go of and to try to find more suppleness and softness in. And there are some muscles, right, that we are learning to engage that haven't really worked very much. I think that's all I have to say about all of that. If you have other questions, email me or you can write in the comments. I would love it to be an open platform so all of us as a community learn from each other. Hey, I'm having a hard time, this is happening. And then I can try to respond or reply to that so people can see and we all can learn from each other. Um, so if you know you have any comments or if you have any questions or uh, you want a better understanding or you think I didn't explain something very well, please, please, honestly, just put it up on the board and let's, um, let's, let's have a community around, uh, around health and healing wholeness, right? Um, and, uh, and otherwise, please enjoy the little ditty on no floor, no core, and enjoy the class on no floor, no core. And maybe be something that you bring in more than just once in your life and start to work with so we start to strengthen these areas that could use a little more oomph and hopefully release the areas that have been doing it for all of these years of our lives that don't have to work so darn hard. Namaste, friends.